The earth is our mother. We must take care of her. The earth is our mother. We must take care of her. Unite, my people, be one. Unite, my people. Actually, it's a bit silly for me to be singing and dancing here because there's some things that you need to do in a group, in community. And you can't do alone, and that is circle dance. And I love dancing, but I have to say that there is a place and a time for everything. And sometimes we leave the place out. And what we've, in the last couple of centuries, we've left out or belittled the village. And now we have started with uh, a new direction. But this new direction is... Is it up there already? Here it is. Right. The new direction is the eco-village. And this is what I'm talking about tonight. Why the hell eco-villages? Why do we need eco-villages? Well, in point of fact, I'm starting with a couple of photographs of the village that I live in now for 30 years. And it's just after I left the, the, the Technical University in Berlin and left my professorship because I felt things have to come from the ground up. We're all talking about change. We're all talking about new perspectives. And we're thinking that it's coming from above. And that's not the way it's happening. We've tried that so often. We've tried it with Christianity. We've tried it with all sorts of different movements. And usually we get very fundamentalistic about it and very, very uh, hard. So uh, our idea is to move towards peace and creativity by having people do it themselves and do what they want to do. It started here also in Berlin, the whole idea of urban co-housing and urban communities. But immediately they started to talk about ecology, self-sufficiency. This is Eisenacher Straße, in, done in the middle of the 70s, when I happened to be professor here in Berlin. And I did some of the, the, uh, the help here. And this is the next step, you could say, from the individual, is to get into the group and get going in a group. And then you realize what you could do. But if you get to a large piece of ground, or something like uh, eight or 10 hectares, then you can really begin doing things. And you can really begin changing things immediately. OK, they take a little time. This has taken 31 years to do. It's, a, it's an old settlement that we found in Lower Saxony. And it uh, has ground beside it, which we slowly, over the years, we bought up one after the other. And we now got something like 70% of our um, self-sufficiency going. Not only in food, but also in energy. So we uh, have gone, even before there were any programs of the German government, we've gone into managing our own electricity as far as we can. We even sell it, managing our own food. And we believe that food also has to show its beauty. So we try to make it in ways and places to um, have also an uplifting feeling, not only through the taste, but also the, the way we look at it. We've gone now one step further, that we're now managing, uh, trying to manage our own mobility with mostly electricity. The small car up at the top 
is uh, the first car run by a solar um, charging station in 1991. And now we're moving towards the fact of having even buses, uh, uh, a bus, which is completely electrical. This we haven't got there yet, but this is the system of going. We get the politicians in on it. We get the producers in on it. We get the uh, business people in on it. And, and even the bus driver right beside me there. And uh, so it's a whole thing of participation. OK, after doing this for 10 years, we decided, and um, I became founding chairman of the Global Ecovillage Network. And we did it with nine ecovillages from all over the world, Australia, United States, uh, um, Denmark, and we um, and, and quite a lot of others. And we had nine people from seven countries and three continents. And we went public in 1995 in the then largest eco village in Europe, that was in Fintorn in Scotland. Now we have 100,000 and more eco-villages in the world, in 100 countries. And it's all happened by the people themselves doing it. And they're communicating with each other, and they're having great fun while they're doing it. And that's a very important part. So what's happening here? Here is where it was actually went public and found it in 95. Already in 96, we started uh, education, eco-village design education, for short, EDE. This is already being done in 167 countries. And, but it's also started in this eco-village in, in uh, Scotland. And they recycle all the time. Whiskey barrels as houses. They recycle old buildings for new, and even to a great extent, the wood that they use in their wooden buildings. We have also recycling of a whole spa in Los Angeles. Los Angeles had hot water up to about three years after the Second World War. And then the hot water ceased to be there because of an earthquake. The, um, in Los Angeles, um, they took over the um, whole spa and they got it going as an eco-village. The water is back by the next earthquake. So now they even have an income. This is an old hospital in Amsterdam, a quarter of an hour from the, the station of the main station of Amsterdam to walk to it. And it's a hospital that was to be pulled down completely. And a group of permaculture people, of uh, actors and artists, and quite a few teachers got together and decided to recycle the whole uh, pavilion hospital that was about to be pulled down. And they built onto it as well, and, and they even used the, the um, operation theatres as theatres and as studios for artists. Putting in uh, grass roofs, but not only grass roofs, vegetable roofs. Putting, and you can see it. You just can, most people in Amsterdam itself don't even know it's there. So then you have the other t the type of eco village that comes out of a planning situation. Uh, Copenhagen decided to put a, in an overhead railway from the outskirting skirting villages, and then to uh, actually 
densify the housing around those stops. You can see right up in the left-hand corner is the railway station, and then the eco-village has grown about it, experimenting with different ways of building and living uh, in the Danish climate. So similar things have been undone in Denmark. In other places, Denmark has the highest amount of eco-villages in the world for the, its population. So we're trying to bring in sustainability, but in traditional cultures as much as possible. We're trying to respond to the social complexity that all planners are doing at the moment. But we're designing from the place, from the people themselves. This is a, a village that has, is down here. At the, uh, was there up to about five years ago, and it's a village extension which is done on the principles of eco-villages. And this is in Ireland, and um, it looks a bit like this at the moment. Uh, this is a, a photograph taken only just uh, two weeks ago. And so they're building up slowly, and they are building up the whole thing uh, on the five zones of permaculture. What we're doing compared uh, to the normal planning systems, and, and you see, I was professor of urban design here, so I was teaching planning methods, etc. Most of our planning methods then were way out because we were pulling into the ecological and economic sense. We were pulling in. Uh, no, no, the social and the economic, we brought, pulled in the ecological. But what's now happening with the eco-villages is that we're pulling in the worldview, the spiritual, the cultural, because we say it hasn't got any sustainability unless it comes from the people, unless it comes from their heart. We need to plan with the heart and plan with the people, or not even plan with the people, let the people plan. So with all this wisdom that we've put together in the last 30 years, we're now beginning to work with governments, and we're <clears throat> just, this is just two weeks ago again, at Marrakesh, at the COP22, Kosha Joubert, who is the the president of the Global Equilibrium Network at the moment is signing with um, Egypt a, a memorandum. And they've signed with 11 African countries, one after the other, two South American countries who have already signed a couple before. So we're actually getting it into the United Nations as a possible solution. We're not saying it's the one and only solution, we're saying it's a possible solution and it should be allowed. Because when we started 30 years ago, we had all the planning permission and everything against us. And even the banks and whatnot, we had to beg, borrow and steal, you could almost say, to keep going. And now you see these groups are taking over. I mean, this is just a beautiful thing for me personally having worked in the United Nations 25 years ago to try and get the idea into their planning systems, in, into their center of habitat, that is now actually happening. This is fantastic. And then the final thing is that we have to get away from this highfalutin idea that only certain people can design. In fact, point of fact, every one of us can design, and we're doing it. We're even designing a garden when we put a plant in. And uh, so what we've done now is we've done a completely different type of education, and it's a four-week intensive education on the four keys that you saw beforehand, the social, the ecological, and the worldview. And it's very intensive, and we've done it uh, in many countries in the world, and it's still going on. 
Then we've gone into other places, and we get empowerment going. It's, um, what's going automatically? Why is that? Okay. Uh, we'll go automatic. You're getting an idea of all the different countries we're going, going to, and uh, where the people are doing things themselves. And uh, we're designing for disassembly. And this is a real old f f phrase and friend of mine. You see, I learned through architecture to be an urban designer. And we were in, into modern architecture. It started in the, in the 30s, but it really got going again after the Second World War. Then we had, about 20 years later, we had postmodern architecture. And what we're doing now is compost modern architecture. We're creating architecture so that when it's finished its use, it's just a huge big compost heap and can be used again. And this is one message I'd like to get over to you all that you can do yourself at home in, in an eco-village, but also within um, a, um, an urban setting. So, um, as you can see, I can go on talking for, for until the cows come home. And so, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get you to use your intuition. You're all going to stand up, and we're going to do an eco-village standing dance, which comes from Argentina. And it goes like this. It has a, a chorus of, hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, ho! All right. Hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, ho! It's then. Hey, hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, ho! Hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, ho! Hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, ho, there's the water. Hey, hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, ho. Hey, hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, ho, the chorus. Hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, ho. Hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, ho. Hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, on fire. Hey, hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, hey, Ananda, ho, hey, hey, Ananda. So I hope I have fired you up for, to a new perspective.